Life. Okay, you're good to go. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to Ask Dr. B. Um, I'm here uh, without Eric today. Eric is uh, taking a, a week to uh, get some r and r. He's been working incredibly hard uh, on uh, some new uh, endeavors, and I'm not sure if you've heard of the ROM coach that is coming out hopefully in the next day or two. Um, it's an amazing app, and I hope that you'll all check it out. Um, it is um, it's a, a really uh, unique opportunity to do a movement screen, figure out where your movement deficiencies are, and then get some uh, exercise prescriptions. And I personally am really excited about the opportunity to use this for my patients in the future um, when I see people who have a painful shoulder or a painful hip, and um, I can then on the app, give them specific exercises that they can use uh, to treat the problem. And so helping me today, Yusuf, uh, he's the man behind the scenes uh, and he's helping me with the technology. Um, I can't actually read the chat. So he's gonna be uh, reading out questions um, later on in the show uh, when we get to that point. Um, so we're gonna start out with, um, uh, with my presentation, which will be about shoulder instability. And uh, I'm really excited about this. Um, this is a, one of my favorite topics. Sorry, I'm just getting onto my, can you see my screen, Yusuf? Yes, we can. Great, let me just put up my slideshow. Here we go. Okay, so today we're talking about loose shoulders or shoulder instability. And this is, um, as I said, one of my favorite topics. It was one of my favorite surgeries to perform. And um, it was very rewarding because uh, it's very successful. Um, today, we're gonna review what shoulder instability is, uh, why the shoulder becomes unstable, what you can do about an unstable shoulder and the role of surgical surgical intervention and or rehab in treating shoulder instability. Uh, before we actually get to the presentation uh, of the, the nuts and bolts of shoulder instability, I wanted to share a story with you. This was um, 2003 uh, opening game for the Toronto Blue Jays and the New York Yankees were in town. And uh, I was the chief orthopedic surgeon for the Toronto Blue Jays for about 10 years. And um, I was standing in the back hall at the Rogers Center uh, talking with one of my colleagues about the fact that we no longer had uh, medical malpractice insurance. Uh, the Canadian Medical Protective Association had decided they were no longer going to cover physicians working with professional athletes. And I think that they were afraid that if we made a mistake with a uh, player who was worth $70 million that we'd just wipe out the whole organization. So we were standing there in the hall and we'd been talking with the Blue Jays and sorting out the insurance uh, when the walkie talkie went off and it was George Poulos and he's the, the head trainer for the Blue Jays. And normally what happens is when a player gets injured on the field is that the trainer goes out, assesses the player and most of the time the player will just come back to the dugout or they'll come into the training room where that's where I'm usually sitting. And uh, then I'll do an assessment, but um, occasionally we have to go out on the field and it's, it's not common, like in 10 years of working with the Jays, I uh, only had to go out on the field three times. And uh, this was actually my first. So I get called down uh, and I'm walking along the third baseline uh, as Derek Jeter had slid into third and uh, dislocated his left shoulder. So he's lying there on the, on the field. And as I was walking out the, uh, the third baseline, the radio announcer goes, oh, look, there goes a woman to console Derek Jeter. And uh, they, they hadn't figured out that um, a woman could be an orthopedic surgeon at that point. But um, I got out there and you can see me out on the field, uh, bending down and I'm watching uh, the trainer from the New York Yankees and he's trying to put Jeter's shoulder back in place. 
So we ended up uh, moving Jeter off of the field and his shoulder was dislocated out the front and everybody's pretty nervous because, uh, you know, we don't have the malpractice insurance and the shoulder hadn't gone in when the trainer tried. And so Jeter's standing there and he's holding his arm and it's out of socket. And I put my hand onto the top of his shoulder and I said, bend over. And as he bent over, I just gently clicked the humeral head back into place and he goes, oh, thanks, Doc. Can I go back out and play? And uh, we were like, uh, no, you're not doing that. And um, the other interesting thing about 2003, it was the first day of SARS, the SARS epidemic. So we went up to Mount Sinai Hospital where uh, we needed to get an x-ray and the media is following us. And the good thing, only good thing about the SARS epidemic was that uh, the media couldn't follow us into the hospital. Um, but that was one of my most uh, memorable uh, events in treating a patient with shoulder instability. So what is instability? What is uh, an unstable shoulder? Um, well, I define joint instability as, or joint stability as um, maintaining the normal alignment or normal anatomic relationship between the bones in a joint while you're moving. So the shoulder as the humeral head and the glenoid are going through the various motions need to maintain their normal alignment so that the humeral head stays centered on the glenoid. And often um, stability uh, is in balance with mobility. The more mobile a joint is, generally the more unstable it is. Uh, the less mobile a joint is, the more stable it is. So um, the fact that the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body makes it the most frequently dislocated. And really when we think about the function of the shoulder, it's to position our hand in space. So we move it, we can flex it and elevate it. We can abduct it to the side, we can extend our arm, and then we have all these various um, degrees of rotation. So there's a lot of freedom of movement in the shoulder. And, um, in order to have this uh, freedom for movement, you can't have a constrained design to the uh, structure. So when we look at instability or loss of the normal alignment of the joint, uh, you can see here the humeral head is normally lined up with the glenoid, uh, but in this uh, middle um, picture, the head has popped out the front. This little bone is the coracoid, it's part of our shoulder blade, and the humeral head has dislocated out the front of the joint. And in this final view, we can see that the humeral head has popped out the back. By far and away, the most common direction for the shoulder to dislocate is anterior or out the front. So when I think about stability of any joint, I look at static stabilizers. These are things that don't really move, they're fixed in position. And that would be the shape of the bones. And in the shoulder, the static stabilizers actually aren't great at stabilizing the, the joint at all. They're, they're designed to allow this great freedom of movement. When you compare that to the hip joint where it, it is a ball and a socket, similar to the ball of the, the uh, shoulder joint and the saucer of the shoulder, the hip in contrast is, is more constrained. So you have the ball with the socket more um, deeply uh, covering the femoral head so that the, the um, hip doesn't dislocate easily. But we also can't put our ankle, most of us actually can't put our ankle up over our shoulder. Um, the glenoid labrum is a fibrocartilage. You can see it here. We're, here we're looking at the top of the shoulder. So this is the humeral head. This is the top um, view, the acromion. And then this is the clavicle. And then this is the, the glenoid socket. And then this is the little bone, the coracoid. If you kind of feel around the front of your shoulder, you'll feel that little bone and it's some kind of, sometimes kind of tender. Uh, but the labrum itself is a fibrocartilage, very similar to a meniscus in the knee. And it deepens the socket by about one eighth, which adds to stability of the shoulder. And then the ligaments that connect between the humeral head and the glenoid, these are fibrous uh, um, structures that uh, act as check reins so that when you move to the end range of motion, they become tight and they prevent the humeral head from sliding out the front, the back or the bottom 
of the shoulder. Now the, the capsule and the thickening, the ligaments in the capsule um, generally are quite loose around the shoulder. Um, I kind of uh, equate them to looking like a shirt sleeve where the ligaments are loose and baggy when your arm is down at your side and then they get tighter as you lift your arm overhead so that they do um, conform to the uh, bones as you move. But if you don't have that little pocket um, of tissue when your arm is down at your side, then you wouldn't be able to move your arm overhead. So um, this, the fact that the ligaments are quite loose in the shoulder uh, means that we have to rely very heavily upon our dynamic stabilizers. So the dynamic is when we're moving, these uh, muscles and tendons of the rotator cuff give feedback to our nervous system to make sure that we're keeping the ball centered on the saucer, no matter where our arm is positioned in space. And so what happens is that when the um, capsular ligament stretch or the tendons start to get too much stretch on them, then there, there's a neurological signal that is sent back through the spinal cord in your brain that says, we're gonna dislocate, we're gonna dislocate. And so that will create uh, a response in the muscles so that the muscles will contract to hold the joint lined up properly. And this is a really key point in shoulder stability. It's probably one of the most important lessons that you can learn from today, that if you do suffer from uh, a loose shoulder or an unstable shoulder, it is critical that you uh, retrain your dynamic stabilizers and your joint proprioception so that you can keep the joint lined up properly. Now we have a spectrum of laxity uh, or instability. So on the far uh, left, we have a normal alignment. Again, we're still looking down at the shoulder from the top where um, this is the humeral head and it's perfectly lined up with the glenoid. Uh, a partial dislocation we refer to as a subluxation. So the shoulder is sloppy. The humeral head moves in and out of the uh, glenoid saucer, but it doesn't actually come completely out of joint. Uh, and then finally, at the far end of the spectrum from normal alignment is a dislocation. And um, as we mentioned earlier, the most common direction for the humeral head to dislocate is out the front. Now, just because you're mobile or hypermobile, it doesn't mean that you uh, have pa pathology. It doesn't um, hypermobility or laxity does not equal instability. And um, I check patients uh, in general for signs of hypermobility and you can try all of these yourself. This is the Baton scale. And so there are five different tests that you do and you do them on both sides of your body. So um, this is Sharon Fishman. She's actually one of our Fed Cup professional tennis players. And she has every sign of hypermobility. She can hyperextend her elbow. And if you look at my elbow, my elbow only goes straight, whereas hers uh, is um, hyperextends. Uh, similarly with her knee, you don't see it quite as well in this picture. Uh, her knee hyperextends. Uh, if you place your hand flat on the table or on your, on your thigh, and then you try to lift your finger up towards the sky, you can see that her finger points right up to the ceiling, whereas I can only go about 45 degrees. Um, Sharon can touch her thumb to her forearm. You can see I can't touch my thumb to my forearm. And Sharon can put her hands flat on the ground. So you get one point for the right and one point for the left. So she ha would get two, four, six, eight, and then one point for touching the floor. So out of nine, if you have more than five positive signs out of nine, you're considered to be hypermobile. And I have zero, so I'm at the other, I'm at the other end of the spectrum. Now, there's some advantages to hypermobility because you have a greater range of motion, which allows you to create more speed with movement. But the downside is, is that you, uh, your joints are looser, and so you really have to rely on the dynamic stabilizers in your body to prevent the joint from being sloppy and laxity becoming instability. So this is a this is, is Sharon's shoulder and um, I'm just pulling towards the ground and this is called an inferior sulcus sign. 
So normally the humeral head would be sitting up underneath the acromion, but you can see this dent. So her joint is actually subluxed. Now, this doesn't bother her at all. It's not painful, um, but it tells me that she could be prone to uh, shoulder instability uh, and uh, tendon problems or labral problems if she loses control of her dynamic stabilizers. So the message here is that if you have multi, um, or if you have hypermobility, it's not a bad thing. It's just, you have to understand that you have it and you have to focus your training um, and your rehabilitation on activating and maintaining activation of your dynamic stabilizers so that you can maintain good alignment of your joint and good function. So when we think about pathological instability, uh, there are two main types, um, TUBS and AMBRI. TUBS stands for a traumatic injury. So um, someone playing football, it's very common for line, um, linemen in football. They're moving forward, they have their hands in front of them, and then the player on the other side runs through them and their arm is forcefully taken into extension and external abduction and external rotation, and they dislocate their shoulder out the front. Um, hockey is common, people going into the boards, um, getting their arms pulled at high velocity um, often can lead to uh, dislocations. Um, most traumatic um, dislocations become unidirectional instability. So that means that the shoulder will only go out in one direction. Um, and most commonly it goes out the front or anterior. Most common uh, pathology that we see for patients with these traumatic unidirectional instability is what's called a Bankart lesion. And that's when the labrum that is at the front of the shoulder gets knocked off of the, um, the glenoid. So there's a tear of the labrum at the front of the shoulder. And oftentimes these patients do need surgery, but we're gonna talk about this in a little bit more detail in a second. The, um, and the, the second group of people it's, uh, are referred to as AMBRI. These are atraumatic dislocations. So there may not necessarily be a fall you may just move your arm in the wrong direction and suddenly it pops out a joint. Uh, it could come out in your sleep. Uh, it's often just a very simple movement. You reach into the back seat to get your briefcase and your shoulder pops out. Um, oftentimes people with atraumatic instability uh, will notice that their shoulder goes out in multiple directions. So when they reach into abduction, external rotation, they may be apprehensive. The shoulder will come out the front uh, if they reach across their body and in, into internal rotation, the shoulder can go out the back. Oftentimes, um, AMBRI instability is, involves both shoulders. And this is because it tends to affect people with hypermobility. So uh, structurally, they have loose shoulders to begin with. And um, if they lose control of their dynamic stability, then their shoulders will dislocate. The, the key to treating this type of instability is rehabilitation. Um, rehabilitation, rehabilitation, rehabilitation. And probably 95% of individuals will respond to non-surgical management. Uh, but if they do need to have surgery, then a procedure called an inferior capsular shift where um, the ligaments are tightened is ideal. Most of the time, people with the atraumatic instability don't tear their labrum. They may have a little bit of scuffing, but they don't have a true Bankart lesion. And um, so it's quite, they're quite different forms of instability. So what do you do if you dislocate your shoulder? Um, well, the first thing, some people know how to put it back in. Um, I don't really advise that you try to put it back in if you're uh, you know, somewhere remote and not going to be able to see a doctor, then I would, the only thing I would suggest is what I did with Derek Jeter is that when you really relax your muscles and you bend forward, uh, gravity does most of the work. I did just a very minor little, you know, click. Um, but by relaxing and bending forward, the humeral head could just fall right back into place. Um, and so you can try that, but I wouldn't, um, recommend that you try manipulating and moving your arm around too much because you can actually create more damage. And this is a little trick where you can take your 
You can take your hand and place it on the opposite shoulder just so that your shoulder isn't moving around too much. And then you can secure your arm there by lifting your shirt up and uh, to hold your arm in place. So you'll feel less pain if you're uh, not moving around when the shoulder's dislocated. Um, and this is a picture of what a dislocated shoulder looks like. You can see the acromion here and there is a deformity. The, the, the normal roundness that we see to the shoulder is lost. So I recommend that you go to the hospital. Um, you should have an x-ray to rule out a fracture that could be associated with the, with the dislocation. And whether you have a fracture often depends upon the mechanism of the injury and the higher the energy of the injury, like a car accident or a serious fall, um, the, the chances of having a fracture are somewhat higher. Um, and when you're much older, older individuals who have some osteopenia, because that means that their bone density isn't quite as strong, may be prone to fractures when they suffer a dislocation. Um, you need to check out for nerve injuries. Uh, this picture here uh, demonstrates the, the humeral head. We have the rotator cuff tendons and the muscle. And the brachial plexus is all the nerves that come from the spinal cord out um, from the neck underneath your collarbone and down into your arm. And there's one nerve here that's called the axillary nerve and it will be put under a tremendous stretch and tension when the shoulder dislocates out the front. So we always check people uh, for sensation. It's the, over the military patch and to check the function of the deltoid to make sure that the deltoid can contract. Uh, it's important to make sure that the, the nerve hasn't been damaged either uh, at the time that the shoulder dislocates or when the shoulder is being put back into joint. Uh, the key to uh, 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 the most effective reduction or putting the bone back into its anatomic position is relaxation. So you, you have to have, um, we call it a neurolept anesthesia. The, there'll be two physicians. One will be monitoring your breathing and the other will be monitoring your state of consciousness. And you need to have your muscles relaxed. If your muscles are tight when you're trying to, uh, uh, the doctor is trying to um, reduce your shoulder, uh, you're potentially uh, pushing the humeral head against the glenoid and that can actually create more damage uh, to the joint. So relaxation is critical in um, a safe and effective close reduction. It's extremely rare that a uh, close reduction cannot be performed in the emergency room, um, you know, over my 30 years, I think only once I've had to take a patient to the operating room. Occasionally, the long head of the biceps, which it inserts on the glenoid, will get trapped in the joint and it'll prevent you from putting the humeral head back into joint. And then we, we have to do surgery to um, get the joint reduced. But 99% of the time or more, you're going to have the shoulder effectively reduced in the um, emergency room. And then it's important that you do start rehabilitation. Now, you, ha you, you, um, you have to be a little careful because the muscles go to sleep. Your rotator cuff, it's, I, I equate them to a, a bird that's hit a window. They're kind of stunned. They're alive. They're there, but they're, they're, they're not really functioning well, and they don't really know what to do. And as we've talked about a lot already today, the critical thing um, in recovery from shoulder instability is making sure the muscles are working properly. So the muscles of your rotator cuff are asleep. They're kind of stunned. Um, so you have to gently waken them up. So you have to be a little careful. I, I wouldn't want you going and you know, putting your arm into a position where you're at risk for dislocating your shoulder again right away until you get the muscles uh, awoken up. Uh, and it's also really important to distinguish between the two types of instability because the natural history is very different. People with the AMBRI type of uh, instability where they haven't had significant trauma generally don't have a lot of damage to the joint surface. And the major problem is loose ligaments and the dynamic stability. Whereas the Tubbs uh, group tend to be younger, very athletic uh, men who are involved in collision types of sports, and they can have a redislocation rate of up to 50%. Uh, so surgery, that's why surgery is said to be common, but I personally believe that if you adequately rehabilitate um, a traumatic instability that you have a greater than 50% chance and probably closer to a 75% chance of avoiding recurrent instability. 
So what do we do? And, and this comes back to the principles of our performance pyramid, where what we have to do is um, allow the, the ligament uh, and or bony injuries to heal as a result of the dislocation. So in the AMPRI group, the ligament actually doesn't really get torn that much. There may be a little stretching, but there isn't the same degree of inflammation, um, I find. And, and also, if it's not the first time that your shoulder is dislocated, if your shoulder dislocates frequently, um, there generally isn't as much inflammation. So the, the healing time would be much shorter. It would be instead of four to six weeks for the first time dislocation, it would be probably uh, seven to 10 days. So during this relax phase, we have to protect the ligament. And we're gonna talk about first time dislocation. Um, the ligament that's at the front of the shoulder in the Bancart area where you potentially have an injury, we need to protect that. So I, would, I tell my patients to avoid this extreme of abduction and external rotation to allow that ligament to heal in a shorter position. So people can keep their elbow, arm at their side, they can keep their elbow tucked in, and you can externally rotate your arm in this position without putting any stretch on that. And if you kind of play around with your shirt sleeve, uh, they, it will act kind of like the ligaments do. You can feel that when you get tension on the shirt sleeve at the front in this position, that's where the, you're stressing the ligaments at, where in, um, that may have been injured by the uh, dislocation. Uh, so you can see that when your elbows tucked in at your side, you don't put the same kind of tension. So the advantage of being able to move um, while the ligaments are healing is it will prevent the shoulder from getting really stiff and you can keep the muscles um, awake. So um, I give people this protected range of motion for four to six weeks until the ligament heals. Um, and we start rotator cuff isometrics right away. And remember that isometric exercises um, happen when you're not moving your joints. So you just are gonna have the arm at your side and you're gonna push and stimulate the subscapularis muscle uh, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor to get those muscles awake so that they can help to control the stability. Also, by activating these muscles, um, I find that the swelling that may be associated with the dislocation goes away much faster. The subscapularis is the rotator cuff muscle that's right at the very front of the shoulder. And when the humeral head comes out the front, it's going to stretch that muscle and Sometimes there's little injury in the muscle itself. It's more of a micro injury, but by isometrically contracting the subscapularis, you will help to get rid of the swelling. And so your pain goes away uh, much faster. You can do any kind of scapular mobility by moving my, my scapula and doing shoulder circles. I'm not at risk of my shoulder dislocating because I'm not even moving the glenohumeral joint. So we go through the first four to six weeks, you're gonna have some lack of mobility because we haven't let you go here. So then at that point, we start to allow you to regain your full mobility. And then it's important to put all of the muscle function together so that the scapular muscles are working with the rotator cuff muscles that are working with their core. And we start working on more functional range of motion. And at this point, what we've done is we've reestablished our foundation for movement. One of the key things for uh, recovery from shoulder instability, in my opinion, is a rhythmic stabilization. And Eric has got some, he's got fantastic courses that work uh, in the shoulder control course that work on joint centration, meaning that you're keeping the shoulder joint perfectly lined up. But these are very slow motion slow movements that are very controlled and they're perfect for the first phase of recovery from uh, shoulder dislocation. But when you want to start getting back to your activities and progressing up the pyramid, I really like to start using what I call rhythmic stabilizations and progressions for the rotator cuff activation. So here on the left, Sharon is lying uh, on her back and she's got her arm up pointed towards the ceiling and she's actually lifting her um, scapula or her shoulder blade off of the bed. And what this does is it just isolates the rotator cuff. And then what I'm doing is I'm just gently tapping on her arm, just trying to push her arm a little forward, a little backward. And she has been instructed to try and keep her arm still. So I don't want her to move her arm. 
So when I give a little push, she has to react and the rotator cuff has to react to keep the ball centered on the saucer. And what you can do is start out, you go very slowly and very controlled so that the muscles that may be a little kind of sleepy can wake up and they can become more reactive. And then you can become more complex in how you do the tapping. So you change the rhythm instead of just sort of hit, you know, tap, 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 you go tap, tap. And the neuromuscular system has to really be alert uh, and you can change the direction. You can tap the side of the arm and um, really train the muscles to uh, be awake and alert and they can compensate for the loss of a ligament. So say you have a bank heart lesion and you've torn your labrum or stretched the ligaments at the front of your shoulder, the dynamic stabilizers can compensate for the lack of your static stabilizer with training. And as we progress this, what I actually do is I have the person start to go through movements that they may want to use in whatever activity or sport that they're going to do. So um, here, Sharon is kneeling. We're doing this to just isolate the core and her um, right arm. She holds onto a band to, uh, in her left arm to activate the core. And then um, I have her mimic a, a forehand, say in tennis. So I start out with her arm, um, or I, sorry, I take her arm into the, all the different positions. So you will go into the take back, which could be a, a point where you would feel uh, apprehensive that your shoulder is going to dislocate. And we would do the same kind of rhythmic stabilizations. And you would do it with the take back at the point of impact and then at the follow through. And you can do it with every kind of movement. You can, you could do it for a serve. You can do it for um, reaching back into your back seat in the car, but you want to do it in a controlled way at first so that you really train the neuromuscular system to be responsive. Um, so that once you, um, once you get your muscles responsive, you don't, you're not apprehensive and fearful that your shoulder is going to dislocate and, and your body can protect you. So as you're starting to progress up the pyramid, once you've got your motion, you've got all the right muscles working and you've got um, your muscle activation patterns uh, in order, then we have to start building endurance and we really do, we focus uh, on progressing these proprioceptive type of um, training exercises. You need to make sure that you're using your kinetic chain when you go back to sport. So if you're gonna be throwing um, or you know, striking any kind of ball, puck, uh, whatever it may be, that you're using your legs to generate the force and not using your shoulder muscles. Um, I really like using kinesio tape. Um, and or a compression, compression sleeve for the shoulder when patients first start going back to their activities. And the reason for this is that the, um, the tape uh, acts as um, an additional uh, bit of proprioceptive feedback. So when you put the tape on the front of the shoulder, when you reach back, the tape will pull on your skin and that, the, that tension in the skin actually gives a neural feedback to the nervous system and the muscles to tell them, okay, you gotta get ready to get, get it get active. And um, it's important also that you don't go too quickly up the pyramid to try to th throw or, or move your arm um, at the fastest, uh, most powerful way. You've got, to, you've got to go one step at a time, building your endurance strength to eventually get to your power and speed. And I like to um, have people focus on the rhythm of the movement that they want to do, build the duration of their capability to do that activity at 40 or 50% of normal intensity. And when you're pain-free and, and most of the time you're pain-free, um, but when you're confident and you don't feel apprehensive that your shoulder is gonna go out of joint, then at that point you can start building the intensity of uh, the activity. So you can go from 40 or 50% up to 60 or 70%. You do that for a period of time. If you still feel comfortable, then you move up to 80, uh, et cetera. So what do you do? You do all the right things. You've done everything that I've asked you to do. You've gone, you've you know, built your foundation for movement. You've gone in a progressive manner back to your activity and then your shoulder keeps popping out of joint. So what are we gonna do? So um, I then explore uh, with people what kinds of activities they're doing. Um, you know, if it's only coming out of joint when you're getting hit by a 400 pound football player, 
then you need to decide, okay, do I want to keep playing football um, or uh, am I, have I had enough? Um, skateboarding can be a problem or snowboarding where people um, fall and land and you're, it's a high velocity fall and can be challenging to uh, control your shoulder stability because of the fact that you've got such an awkward uh, landing. So people need to make life decisions and decide whether or not they want to modify their activities or whether they want to consider um, surgery. And um, I generally recommend that if you, you, know, you love your activity and you want to keep doing it and you've done all the right things from, um, from a, a rehabilitation standpoint and, you're, and, then, and we find that you have a structural lesion like a Bancart lesion. So this is a picture here. We're looking um, at the glenohumeral joint arthroscopically. The camera is at the back. And this is the front corner of the glenoid. This is the articular cartilage. You can see that it's white and smooth here. And then it looks kind of like a shag rug. And this is an arthroscopic probe that has been put into the front of the joint. And the probe has a little hook on it. And the hook is in a tear of the labrum. So and this tissue here is the capsule at the front of the shoulder uh, and the joint is actually distended with fluid. So um, there is a, a lesion here that if potentially we repair the ligament back to the bone, A, there's going to be more tension on the ligaments which will give better feedback to the muscles which will allow the individual to dynamically control and statically control the stability of the joint. Um, and so I really got interested in shoulder uh, instability when I was a, a fellow. So when you do your training as an orthopedic surgeon, you, you're an intern, then you do a residency, which is five years. And then uh, I went to UC, I did my training at, in, at the University of Toronto. And then I went to UCLA and I did a fellowship, which is like a subspecialization in uh, sports medicine and shoulder surgery. And when we were fellows, we had to do a research project and my project that I chose to do was on shoulder instability. And um, what I wanted to look at was a Bancart lesion, which was referred to as the essential lesion for shoulder instability. At the time we thought, okay, you dislocate your shoulder, you tear the labrum off the front of the glenoid. All you have to do is repair the, the labrum back to the bone and away you go. So, um, there was a new technique. We were just starting to do arthroscopic stabilizations back then. And what I wanted to do was to look at uh, the pullout strength of this MyTech suture anchor. So what I did is I took a shoulder, uh, a cadaver shoulder, and I removed all of the soft tissue except for the capsule. So we're looking at the side of a, a shoulder. This is the, the, um, shoulder blade, the acromion, this is the humeral head and the glenoid you can, I've sort of put faded the, humor, the humerus itself. So you can see the outline of the humerus and then underneath is the glenoid and we have all of the ligaments that are attached. So what I did is I put on force transducers and I applied a force to the humeral head from the back to the front. And I wanted to measure the normal translation of the humeral head as it went out the front. And so I measured normal. And then my plan was to create a Bancart lesion. So I would take a surgical scalpel and create a Bancart lesion. Then I would, re then I would re repeat the testing and uh, measure how much translation there was with the same force being applied. And then I would repair the Bancart lesion with this MyTech suture anchor and see uh, how much force we had to apply to, to um, failure of the, of the suture anchor. I never got to the point of putting the suture anchor in because I went and I created this surgical Bancart lesion and I couldn't dislocate the shoulder. And I'm like, well, why not? Because this is the essential lesion. I should be able to dislocate the shoulder. And it wasn't until I actually removed or transected the capsule all the way from one o'clock all the way around the back to uh, about one o'clock or, or sorry, 11 o'clock that I could actually dislocate the shoulder. And I thought, well, this is insane. So I started to think about the instability uh, and the shoulder stability as a circle. And that in order to 
dislocate the shoulder, we had to have an injury out the front. So we dislocate the shoulder out the front. We had to have an injury at the front of the shoulder and at the back of the shoulder. And we see various combinations of lesions. So we could have the Bankart lesion, which is an injury at the front. And we could have just capsular stretching. So a very loose capsule would then be the injury at the back, the, the tissue back here, because the humeral head has been forced out the front, this tissue has been stretched and torn as well. Or we get this lesion called a hill sacs lesion. So when the humeral head is sitting out the front, the humeral head is in contact with the front of the glenoid. I think, I, yes, I have a picture of it here. So this is, this is the front, this is the humeral head, this is the glenoid. When the humeral head dislocates out the front and it's sitting on the front of the glenoid, you can see that the glenoid is making a dent in the humeral head. It's kind of like sticking your thumb in a ping pong ball. And this is why I don't want you moving your arm around too much when you dislocate your shoulder and we wanna do a very atraumatic reduction. If you reef on the, um, and rotate the arm around trying to reduce it, you can actually really create a large hill sacs lesion in the back of the humeral head. So you can have a combination of bony injury at the back, a hill sacs lesion combined with a soft tissue injury at the front, either a, a labral tear or ligament injury. Um, that leads to shoulder instability. And this is really important for the surgeon to understand when they're going to go and repair the instability. Because if you just fix one part of the problem, you don't restore normal stability to the joint. So um, there's many different ways to approach shoulder instability surgically. Uh, you can do it open, meaning you make an incision or you do it arthroscopically where you primarily work through a fiber optic scope and then little portals. Um, and I personally liked doing open uh, procedures. Uh, and the reason for this is we didn't have to, um, or I could get a better view of the ligaments and I could tension the ligaments, ligaments more effectively, I felt um, when I did it open versus arthroscopic because the, the capsule uh, and capsular ligaments are partially attached to the muscles and you have to um, gently release the muscle from the capsule so that you can um, mobilize the, the ligaments properly. And, uh, but that's just my personal preference. There are many excellent arthroscopic surgeons out there and they feel comfortable in um, their capsular shift or tensioning arthroscopically. Um, again, I think you need to address the Bankart lesion the hill sacs lesion, and this is something that's really uh, come into vogue uh, in the last 10 years, um, is an important lesion. Um, if you have a, a large hill sacs lesion, then you may actually have to do something to prevent that hill sacs lesion from engaging on the front of the uh, glenoid. And the beauty of doing, I would do an arthroscopy first. Uh, and then um, what you can do is you can see the glenohumeral joint and you can rotate the uh, shoulder so that you can tell whether or not the um, hill sacs lesion is going to engage. That means it's going to fall, the humeral head is going to fall off and you're going to see this kind of a picture. Um, and if that is so, then you need to fill that hole in because the capsular laxity may not be enough uh, or, or tightening the capsule may not be enough to prevent the hill sacs lesion from engaging. But that's a little bit of a complex technical thing that you really don't need to worry about. Um, I think what you need to worry about is that you get good, you, you have good balance um, to the shoulder post-operatively so that you can maintain the shoulder stability. Now there's a very special group of people who complain uh, or have um, shoulder instability, but they don't really know it. Most people who have instability know it. They move and they feel the shoulder clunk out of joint or they move and they feel it sliding. Um, and pain is, is not a huge feature. It's a huge feature, obviously, when your shoulder dislocates. 
But um, between the episodes of instability, the shoulder often doesn't hurt that much unless you've done a lot of damage to it and then it may ache a bit. But it's not like uh, pain is inhibiting you all the time from doing your activities. So um, this group of people um, presents more with pain. They don't know that their shoulder is going out of joint. They're often younger than 30 years of age. And um, they do activities, they're swimmers, gymnasts, weightlifters, uh, overhead athletes, and they come in complaining of pain that's an impingement type of pain. And it's um, because their shoulder is subluxing, it's not completely going out of joint, but their shoulder is sloppy. And what is happening is that they're pinching the supraspinatus rotator cuff tendon, and that tendon is becoming inflamed and starting to degenerate. So it's a really important, um, it's really important that you recognize that you do suffer from some instability because that's the primary issue that needs to be treated. I don't know how many weightlifters um, I've seen in their 50s and 60s who never realized that they had this underlying subluxation and they're pumping big weights and they get back to do their, their chest press and they're in this position and their shoulder is subluxed and they've done it 5 million times and with a high load and they wear their shoulders out and they get really um, diff they get arthritis. So it's important that you don't just say, okay, we need to rest and we need to um, treat the uh, shoulder tendon. You actually have to really work on the dynamic stability of the joint. What are the long-term issues? You know, if you're having recurrent instability, uh, you need to see somebody to determine uh, whether it's um, manageable with exercise alone or whether you do need surgery, uh, because you want to avoid the shoulder from going out repetitively. If, it, if the shoulder keeps going out of joint, you eventually do tear the, the, tear the labrum you, or you eventually damage the articular surface. And this results in arthritis. So uh, we do want to uh, avoid our arthritis. And um, that's all I have to say. So I'm hoping that um, we have some questions. Okay, that was super interesting. And we, uh, we definitely have some questions. Uh, there's a few in the, in the chat here. Um, first, we're going to go to the questions that were submitted through the form. Okay. And I believe you wanted to go um, to Mike's question. Uh -huh. uh, so let me get that here and read that out. So I am in the level one of the scapula routine. I am really impressed so far and I'm following it. Um, however, I'm getting pain at the shoulder joint later after workouts, sometimes causing me to need more recoup time. My shoulders have long made crunch, crunching sounds and do so during the exercises. Should I be concerned? And what precautions can I take to keep on track and strengthen my shoulders? Um, he included a bit of history. So he's been super active and healthy, but I've always been more of a lower body person. The upper body has never been easy to build and all the computer time is causing range, a range of pains in the back and hyperactive traps. Okay, so um, Mike, I think that it's great that you're doing the um, scapular program um, and I would stick with it, but what you might wanna do is um, when you're doing your isometric contractions, instead of doing those contractions at 80, 90, 100%, back off on the um, intensity of the contraction so that you're not compressing tissues and creating crunching. Um, I would also suggest that you do these um, exercises looking in the mirror to make sure that you're getting the proper dissociation and then reassociation and activation of the muscles because a lot of the crunching often, um, it depends whether the crunching is in the shoulder itself, like up in, up in this area or whether it's under the shoulder blade. So if you move your shoulders, sometimes your shoulder blades, if they haven't moved a lot for a long time, they will be kind of crunchy when they're moving against the chest wall. And if it's not painful, that crunching is not painful. I don't worry about it too much, um, but I would, I would suggest that you continue with the exercises, but make sure you have good form and um, maybe back off on the intensity until the aching afterwards stops. And also, um, 
you know, if you're not sure you're using good form, um, I believe that uh, we have um, the ability now for you to um, get some support where uh, Joshua can watch you do your uh, exercises and make sure you're doing them technically correctly. Uh, and finally, I would use a hot and cold contrast to deal with the ache, but I think it's really important that you do strengthen your upper extremities and um, work on your uh, dynamic stability. Okay, uh, another question here from the uh, forum comes in from Stephen, who is 21 and into weightlifting and rock, rock climbing. Um, his question was, he fixed acute shoulder impingement symptoms with stretching and mobility work, but affected shoulder is noticeably weaker with pressing and curling. No pain, just weakness. Is that normal and any tips? Thank you, so, he's a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Stephen. Um, Stephen, I think you are the person that I was talking about in the very last slide. You're 21. Um, and oftentimes instability in your age group, particularly with a press, chest press, is this feeling of weakness. So what's probably happening is that your rotator cuff isn't actually holding your joint properly lined up. So you can, um, patients would often describe to me a feeling of weakness, uh, or if they're throwing and doing repetitive types of throws and their shoulders subluxing, they may feel like their arm is dead. Uh, kind of numbness going all the way down the arm. So I think you have subluxation. So I think it's really important for you to do some of these dynamic stabilizations. Make sure that you wake up or turn on the rotator cuff right before you do your chest press. Don't fatigue it, but make sure that it's on so that it's holding that joint really well aligned for you overload with uh, a heavy weight. Okay, and the last question from the form that you had pointed out um, comes in from Ken. And it's more of a general question. What part of the rotator cuff do you tend to see the most injured? Um, infraspinatus, uh, subscapularis, or supraspinatus? Okay, so that's a good question, Ken. And there's a really typical pattern that we see. Um, the supraspinatus is by and far um, the most common tendon that is affected uh, with tearing then um, what happens is that the tear will begin uh, in um, at the sort of anterolateral corner of your shoulder. And um, the long head of biceps is right beside that. So sometimes it's affected. So the tear starts out as just intrasubstance tearing and then can progress to a partial thickness tear, then a full thickness tear. And then the tear tends to go around the back to also involve the infraspinatus. And this takes decades. It takes a really long time for that to happen. That's the, probably the most common tear pattern that I see in my uh, practice. There is a subset of people who will tear their subscapularis and have a long head of biceps issue, um, but that is not as common. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to the chat area here for some of the live questions. Uh, first in was Mark, uh, 65 years old, pain is all across the front of the shoulder, uh, movements, moving arm across the chest and back, sometimes just sitting still with the arm hanging down. So that was just the kind of the background in terms of age and pain. Um, his question was, um, I've been told by a shoulder doctor that I have bursitis, tendonitis, and arthritis in my left shoulder. I have several of Kochi's programs, and they have helped some. Any other ideas? Well, I guess I would wonder how far you've gone in, in the program and which specific one um, to treat. So arthritis, bursitis, um, and uh, tendonitis, it's a constellation of um, pathologies and words that doctors use that basically um, means that you're not mechanically using your shoulder correctly. And the beauty of Coach E's program is that uh, as you progress through the program, you um, establish your foundation for movement. So I would need a little bit more information to kind of figure out where you're lacking in the foundation for movement. And what I mean by the foundation for movement is how is your shoulder aligned? And that means, you know, your shoulder blade, how it's positioned on your chest wall, whether your thoracic spine is moving properly, then the balance of the soft tissues you have good flexibility and you can, and um, strength of all of the muscles around your shoulder. And um, 
finally, are you using the correct muscles? So I would be, um, I think you're in great hands with Coach E's program. And maybe what you want to do is reach out for the um, opportunity to talk with Josh, to have him watch you do the exercise, to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And uh, if, if uh, not, we can make some little tweaks in, um, in the program so that you can progress. Because there's always ways of modifying. And you might, you might find that when you work um, in what I call the impingement range, um, that you're too sore. So what you should do is start with the exercises, moving your arm a little lower uh, or actually a little higher, believe it or not, and try the exercises to see if you're able to kind of get things turned on. But it might be best that you check in with Josh to have him have a look at how you're moving. Okay. Next question comes in from Deanne. Uh, my right supraspinatus and teres minor were torn off the bone about 25 years ago and tendon has retracted. Any recommendations for strengthening what's left in the rotator cuff? Now, she also included some background information. Uh, she's 79, and the extent of the injury was not initially diagnosed. Uh, she's had physiotherapy and has above average uh, range of motion due to hours of exercising. So she also got an MRI about seven years ago. Okay. Uh, Deanne, um, good question. So when you look at the rotator cuff muscles, um, they're, they're like four guide wires that surround the ball and the saucer. And so you've lost two of them. So what's really important is to get the other two functioning well so that they can compensate. And um, I'm not sure how much pain you're in when you're trying to move um, with just lifting your arm up over your head, but I find a really good way of activating the muscles um, is to get into water. And so you can stand in water. If you don't swim, throw on a life jacket. You don't have to swim, but I want you to get into the water and I want you to use the buoyancy of the water so that you can lift your arm and learn to activate the remaining, the subscapularis. And you said it was the teres minor. That would be a very unusual pattern. Um, I've actually never seen supraspinatus and teres minor isolated in a tear. It would, it more commonly is supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So it may be that your subscapularis and your teres minor are still intact, but the other two are gone. So you want to try and get those muscles and particularly the subscap function, um, uh, functioning well. And this is something actually Eric and I want to do together because, um, it's helping people who have got some pathology to learn to activate uh, their muscles. We'd like to put together a program uh, for you. But in the meantime, try the water. And uh, what you'll find is that the water takes the weight of your arm away and will allow you to turn those little rotator cuff muscles on. And then when you get out of the pool, they'll stay on and um, it'll help you to um, function better. Okay, thanks, Doc. Um, next up is Tyler, 27 years old, otherwise decent in decent shape. Um, this question is, any tips you can give me to refine my understanding of my particular shoulder instability? My right shoulder became weak and unstable after three years of leaving FAI untreated in my left hip. Sorry, so your shoulder became, un was there an injury, Tyler? Um to the shoulder? Uh, let me see here. I don't think he included any other information. So Tyler, if you're watching, if you can include a little bit more. Oh, if it's helpful, uh, if it's helpful, I also did heavy shoulder based workouts, including Olympic rings for a few months that really uh, exacerbated, exacerbated the shoulder instability, still only in the right shoulder slash blade. Okay, so I would be really focusing on getting the, doing those dynamic rhythmic or, or sorry, rhythmic stabilization type of exercises. Get a friend, uh, family member, uh, or your trainer, your physiotherapist, somebody to help you to turn on your rotator cuff with your arm in all sorts of different positions. Um, when your rotator cuff is asleep and the shoulder starts to sublux uh, or starts to go out of joint, all kinds of other muscles have to turn on and work extra hard to keep the joint lined up. So you start to do funny things like winging your scapula. And when you wing your scapula, then the muscles that support your scapula are working too hard and they become painful. 
So I would really focus on the dynamic uh, rhythmic stabilization for the rotator cuff. Okay, just a couple more questions here for you. Are you still okay to continue? I'm good, yeah. Okay. Um, so we got Tyler. Okay, next up is Imad. Um, 43 years old and I have two times fractured collarbone with a malunion as I did not have surgery. Strength is back, but stability in extreme range, um, range of motion is not optimal. What can I do? So, um, Imad, what I would be doing then is working, working towards that range. I kind of talk about like a circle of injury where you've got a range where you're very comfortable. So say you're very comfortable with your arm at this level at 120 degrees, say, but you have difficulty when you get up to 170. Train gradually and progressively into those areas where you're not quite as comfortable. So you can have someone help you with the rhythmic stabilizations. You can take a, a band, uh, a, a resistance band that's very light, step on it. You can move your arm up and hold it, hold the band and have it stretched across your body. And then you can do these movements with your arm to turn your rotator cuff on um, and to strengthen. Um, so you're gonna work from your zone where you feel comfortable to the zone that you don't feel comfortable. You kind of just push that, you wanna be pushing the zone so that you get more and more comfortable and uh, give your body time to adjust. Okay, uh, next up is MJ. I was told in my early thirties due to a BMX fall as a teenager that I would need a full shoulder replacement in my, by my forties. I'm 37 now and I find if I'm mindful of what I do, I can work out hard without pain. Just some occasional discomfort. Uh, both doctors I saw assumed I'd be in a ton of pain all the time. Just curious about how to strengthen and how far I can push workouts. So um, MJ, first of all, I, like, I always tell patients, I never treat the x-ray, we treat people. And I'm amazed at how much pathology you can have on an x-ray and have zero symptoms. So um, good for you for working, you know, working towards things. And I think what you want to do is gradually, um, you want to gradually uh, push the range of motion or at least work to maintain the range of motion that you have in your shoulder um, by doing uh, Coach E's um, shoulder uh, mobility exercises. Um, I'm not sure if you've tried any of his courses, but um, I think that they would be perfect for you. Um, you're going to focus on maintaining a foundation for movement. And I've talked about that already today, which is going to be making sure that you've got good alignment of your shoulder, that your shoulder blade is in good position, that your thoracic spine is moving well, and that you've got the right muscles turned on. So you want to really make sure that your rotator cuff is strong and functioning well and responsive. And uh, the shoulder control course is really great for that. So I would suggest that you try that out. And okay. keep going, keep going. You know, like you, you, sometimes with shoulders, you never have to have surgery because we don't walk on them. We don't load them the same way. So if you keep your shoulder mobile and strong, you may never have any problem with it. All right, you're definitely getting lots of love in the chat here. People are uh, very thankful for Oh. So the question is being answered in the information. Oh, um, next one is from Gary. So it's a bit of a longer one, uh, just giving you some background info. So 56 years old, recently have a pain that appears to be coming from the upper part of my humerus around where the middle deltoid attaches to it. The pain is apparent when I rotate my bent arm across my chest and appears to reduce or disappear with more such movement. When I'm at rest and move my arm across, the pain comes back. I know it was caused after I did some deep ring dips. Uh, rings seem to be something that's uh, <laughs> uh, that's coming through here. Okay, so um, it does not appear to be a muscle or AC joint inflammation, as I had that before, and I know what it feels like. I'm also able to lift weights in bench and shoulder presses and do not experience pain when doing these. Um, there is some pain during side lateral raises, but I use light weights while doing them. What could be the likely area of damage? That's scary. Well, 
Gary, the area that you're describing kind of out here is a classic supraspinatus um, muscle tendon pattern of referral. Um, I would want to make sure that you've actually got a, um, a, a mobile posterior capsule and shoulder. Um, you can test this on yourself. If it's a little tricky to test for yourself, but you have to kind of support your shoulder. You have to put your opposite hand on the top of your shoulder and you bring your elbow in front of your body. And what you're, you're holding your arm there because you don't want to just let your shoulder blade move across your body. You're trying to determine whether you have tightness right at the back of the shoulder here. And what I would uh, suggest is that you look up um, the modified sleeper stretch. Eric does a great little video to show you how to release the posterior capsule and then start doing some exercises to turn on the rotator cuff. If you have this tightness at the back of the shoulder, what happens is that when you go to lift your arm up, there's an obligatory upward motion of the humeral head and you immediately impinge the supraspinatus. So if you just try to strengthen, you're not actually successful because you keep impinging the, the part of your body that's already sore and complaining. So you have to rebalance the shoulder first by releasing the posterior capsule with the modified sleeper stretch and then turn on your rotator cuff. That's what I would suggest. Okay, and the last one um, is from Agnes. Let's see where it starts. It's another lengthy one here. I have a problem with my SC joint. It started with the sharp pain on top of my shoulder, which went away itself and got back a few times. After some time skipping in SC joint um, started, it is not pleasant feeling, plus some, something skips on top of my shoulder. MRI of the shoulder is clear, but in my opinion, the affected arm. Um, not sure what she means by the skipping here. Okay. For skipping arm, then the other healthy arm. Um, I am hypermobile, mm -hmm. but it is minor. I feel pain after, after activity on top of my arm or top anterior part and pain around SC joint. Okay. Um, I guess with these specific movements, uh, visited many specialists, no avail. I am undergoing dextrose, I think some sort of therapy here for SC joint plus AC joint. Now plus uh, trained rotator cuff muscles. It's been a year now since it started. Um, 38, but in good shape. Not sure if really got the gist of the issue here, Doc. Yeah, okay, I get it, I hope. Okay, um, okay. But I, I think what's happening to Agnes is that she's getting pain. This is the sternoclavicular joint. It's, the, it's where your clavicle joins your breastbone. And if, if you kind of put your finger and shrug your shoulders, that's where motion occurs at the sternoclavicular joint. And it sounds like she's having pain and some uh, issues uh, across the top of the shoulder and in the SH, SC joint. What I found, um, I would be really focusing on the position of your shoulder blade, the mobility of your thoracic spine would be the first things that I would, I want to improve the, the thoracic spine mobility, make sure that you don't have the head forward carriage. And I would be doing exercises actually for your neck and your upper traps. Um, Eric has a number um, of great exercises to kind of turn off the upper traps because if the muscles in your neck get really tight, you're going to limit the way or change the way that the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints work. So your goal is going to be to release the muscles and relax the muscles that are overworked uh, in your neck and upper trap by turning the correct muscles on. So I'm going to, I'll refer you to, um, I guess we'll, we'll have to, I think you should, if you Google um, neck exercises and releasing the upper traps uh, with Eric, um, he's got a couple of great videos that can really help you. And I'd love your feedback. I'd love to hear how it works out because I think it'll make a big difference for you. Fantastic. And um, one of the last things here is there was a comment about um, thinking, I think MJ, yeah, MJ said, uh, very interesting. I always thought I was just very flexible. Turns out I'm hypermobile. And I was thinking the same thing about my daughter because, uh, you know, she yeah. can uh, straighten out her arms and her, you know, you can just see her, her elbow kind of come through and it's, yeah. I just thought it was flexibility, but I guess it's hypermobility. Yes. 
And it, yeah. it's, it's so common. It's like, there's a spectrum of mobility. There's people like myself, which are on the opposite end of the hypermobility spectrum. And we have to focus more on maintaining mobility and flexibility, whereas hypermobile individuals really have to focus on stabilizing their joints. It's a lot of core stability and all the little muscles that surround every joint have to be active and awake and turned on so that they can maintain proper alignment. And it's interesting for me that most of my patients that are hypermobile love to stretch and the people that are uh, not hypermobile and kind of stiff, they love to strengthen and they both have to switch what they're doing. So, um, well, thank you very much, everybody. And thanks Yusuf so, so much for joining me today and helping out. I really appreciate it. And um, we miss Eric and I'm looking forward to him sure. coming back next week. And um, thanks everybody for watching. Um, right. Please, um, please keep coming back. Thanks, thanks so much, Doc. Really okay. appreciate your information. Take care. It's my pleasure.